Coming up on Chopper's Politics. The people of Great Manchester don't want to go cap in hand, you know, begging bowls and all this, that and the other. That might be the socialist way, but it's certainly not the way that the people of Greater Manchester want to be able to live their lives. We have to see that we're not singing entirely from the same hymn sheet. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph Chief Political Correspondent. Chopper to my friends, and this is Chopper's Politics. It's a week of fractured relationships. After 11 days of negotiating, Boris Johnson placed Greater Manchester into a Tier 3 lockdown against the wishes of local leaders after talks failed with the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. Now, when we started this year, the Tories' new red wall seats in the north of England looked like the foundations for years of Conservative dominance. But then COVID-19 happened and cracks started to appear. Greater Manchester, the Liverpool city region and Lancashire are being set up as the canaries in the coal mine for an experimental regional lockdown strategy as an attempt to prevent the expense of what is truly needed. That was Andy Burnham this week. What a long time, 10 months can be in politics. Now to chew over the week's drama and to discuss why Tory MPs in the North are now allied with Labour MPs against the government, I will be joined by William Ragg, Tory MP for Hazelgrove on this week's podcast. And with the no deal Brexit looming, farmers are worried about the impact on their livestock, particularly lamb. And to discuss this, I'll be joined by Mark Bridgman, President of the Country Land and Business Association. But first, charities are in the news more than ever, which for the Charity Commission is not necessarily a good thing because it means more work for their staff. Baroness Stoll, Tina Stoll, is its chairman, and she joins me now on Jobs Politics. Tina Stoll, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Chris. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great to have me. you in, in, in a socially distanced way in the Telegraph studios. Now, there's been a lot of rows about charities recently in the press. Does it worry you when you see a charity in the press? I think of the National Trust reviewing its properties' links with colonialism, being critical of Winston Churchill. That's one big row recently. Do you think charities are losing their way a bit? Well, I think that, I mean, if I can, Chris, just step back a little bit and say that when I first came to the Charity Commission in 2018, at that time, charities had taken quite a dip in public trust and confidence. But um, Why was that again? That was the... um the Oxham scandal. It, it wasn't actually. I think that there had been some other scandals before that as well. I mean, you know, kids' company, oh. sort of fundraising, that sort of thing. Um, but I saw this picture, which was very clear to me, which is, this is an important part of our national life. They do very, very important work. But they have this, you know, corresponding situation where trust and confidence had dropped. And what I think has happened is, is that triggered by some scandals, but also by sort of, you know, that increasing need for people to see institutions that have a special status be more accountable, respectful and responsive to the people that they are relying on for support, not being evident all the time amongst charities. And I think that now in particular, what I don't want to see happen is um, for them to respond to this crisis that they see in terms of their funding by somehow forgetting the fact that everybody makes charity happen and they're relying on everybody and they have got to be able to demonstrate that they are driven by their fundamental charitable purpose, they're concerned about delivering for their beneficiaries, and that the way that they go about doing that work meets people's general expectations of, of what charity means. I don't think they can rely on the fact that they exist to do good as an excuse for them to do it in a way which is bad. And, you know, I mean, you mentioned the National Trust earlier. I mean, National Trust is is a charity which, you know, at the moment is you know coming in for quite a lot of uh, mm. scrutiny and question. I mean, the, the National Trust has a very sort of clear, simple purpose, which is about, you know, preserving some of our sort of great sort of historic places and, and places of, of great beauty and national treasure. And what people sort of expect of the National Trust is that they focus on that purpose. They don't lose sight of that. And when they do things which somehow seem to some of their supporters, some of the people that they're relying on, you know, they shouldn't be surprised if, you know, that leads to questions and criticisms. And I think for something like the National Trust, if they act in a way which makes some of their supporters 
particularly sort of, you know, those who are perhaps greater supporters of that institution or greater users of it than might, you know, others mm. might be, then they need to understand why that will lead to the sort of questions that people have. And the National Trust is, is one that... I mean, you know, I, I, I know and, and I catch up and read what gets written in the Telegraph about charities. And um, it doesn't surprise me that it's, it's getting the attention that it does. And indeed, you know, we are, you know, we at the Commission are in contact with the National Trust. It is our job at the Commission mm. to raise the questions that people have because we're here to represent the public interest. Have you been asking questions about the recent issues in the, in the trust? Sure, yeah. And what do they say back? They explain. Well, I mean, we're, you know, I'm not going to get into the, co- the conversations. conversation that we're, that we're having, mm. but I do think it's important that I and the commission that you know, exist to represent the people who are those sort of supporting the National Trust or any other charity, yes. that they know that we get what it is that they care about. You know, we understand. And that's part of what we're here to do. And that's what we will do. We will ask questions. Are they thin-skinned charities against this kind of criticism, do you think? They tend to put the, well, if you're National Trust, they literally pull the drawbridge up because they own big stately homes, but they don't want to see why they're being criticised for things. I think for those that have been around for a long time... I think what they find they're still coming to terms with is that it's it's no longer acceptable in this day and age for any institution to rely on the fact they've been around or rely on the fact that they have this status and people will always support them as a way of justifying whatever it is that they do. You know, I, I think that there's a need for charities to sort of really understand that you can't take for granted the support that you get. And what we've seen is that people are no longer willing to give charities the benefit of the doubt just because they're a charity. They expect a charity to constantly show that they are different from a business, that they are motivated in a different way, and that how they go about their work and how they ensure that as much as the money that they raise or that is donated to them is used for that end cause. That's important to people. And that's not going to go away. And even when you've done it once, you've got to keep doing it. This is part and parcel of just what people expect now. And we, you know, for me at the Commission, for all of us at the Commission, we want to make sure that the great benefit that comes from charity in this country continues into Mm. the future. You know, we don't want to put that at risk. And what is I, it a risk now? Well, I, I think that I think there's two risks, really. You've got the risk that a lot of big charities are, are facing in terms of, you know, the financial situation that they're in. But you've got this bigger risk that people will start to question if you're not careful whether or not registered status is one that they're you know they're willing to sort of rely on in the way that they have in the past and I'm not saying that's about to collapse or anything I'm not saying that at all I think that you know for us at uh, you know the charity commission you know I take very seriously the expectations that people have of that registered status but you know like anything you can't be complacent about this Mm. you can't as a charity just assume that what you've enjoyed in the past will continue into the future. Should they be paying bonuses to board members? And I've always been surprised when that happens, for example. Senior chief exec pay is a very sort of touchstone issue for people. I mean, it's very much a sort of symbolic way that people can get some sense of whether, in their mind, this is an organisation that is is different from a business, is motivated and driven. And there should be a discount, a charity discount in pay. For, well, I mean, I think that one of the things we've done at the Commission very recently, we've just relaunched the charity register. So you now, you know, you can look at the register of charities online and you see much more information about each individual charity than you have done before. And it includes now, in brackets of, I think it's 10,000, a number of people who are employed, over 60,000, what salaries. So you've got much more information now available to people. And we did that because we know that matters to people. What I say to charities is that we at the Commission, we're not a pay regulator. It's not for us to set pay caps. That's not what we're all about. But the decisions that you make in terms of how much you pay a chief exec, you've got to be able 
to justify that, you've got to be able to show that the decision that you made in the context of that person mm. was because of what better result will, will flow from it. What you can't do and what is unacceptable is to say, well, we've set that pay because they could have earned so much somewhere else. That's not good enough. The kind of justifications that, that people might make. So, you know, I, I, I completely understand why this is important to people and it's why we have made the information about pay so much more available to people. And one of the things that we're also going to do before Christmas, we'll be publishing a paper on senior pay in, in charities and bringing sort of you know even more transparency in order to show what's going on in terms of pay because we know it's important to people. And the figures are published in, in annual accounts so you can see them, can't you? But make them more you easy can. to see, more e- easy to view. You can see them, but I think it's like everything. You know, there's a minimum standard so there's a legal regulatory obligation on charities in terms yeah, of their disclosure. Yeah. But actually, you know, is that enough? Mm. If you really know that the people who you are relying on need a constant reassurance that you are what you say you are, mm. then you find ways to, you know, to be able to demonstrate that to people. When it comes to explaining or justifying pay, not only is it not good enough to say, well, you know, this person could have earned X amount somewhere else, which is what you often see in a business. I mean, that's that's not good enough. The other thing which is not good enough and which sometimes charities tend to rely on is that running a charity is very complex and they're operating sort of in complex environments. Now, In many cases, that is true. I mean, some of the household name charities which people are familiar with, yes, they are, you know, very, very massive, complex organisations. But the expectation of them is even more that, you know, they understand that they are, they're the poster child of charity, you know. So they have an even larger responsibility, Mm. really, to show that they're doing all they can to uphold the reputation of charity because if they aren't doing it, then, you know, yeah. who is? Do you think there aren't enough people from all parts of society on these boards that some boards get slightly captured by a certain interest group which takes charities away from people who give money to the charity? Um, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure that I've seen sort of evidence, you know, in a general way of that, but I think there is an important need for any of the large charities that, you know, are those ones that have that sort of, as I say, universal appeal. You know, they are charities which everybody would feel they can get behind and, you know, want to support and see do well. That, you know, like any other organisation, they will, you know, and should seek to have a diverse composition, but... And outlook. It's not just about diversity of, you know, faith, religion, gender ethnicity, all that sort of thing. It's, it's about outlook. And, and it's particularly important for these organisations and institutions, the vast majority of who is actually donating small amounts of money to them, you know, or standing on the street corner, rattling the tin for them or volunteering for them, that they feel that their perspective, their outlook is understood you took over, didn't you, in February 2018 as chairman of the Charity Commission. Your term is due to be renewed or end, in, end next year. What are your plans? It's a huge privilege to be chair of the Charity Commission, I must say that. And, and certainly between now and when I finish at the end of February, I am going to keep on the mission that I've been on since I arrived. That's so not you're going standing to drop. down in February? I will be finishing in February. I mean, this was, uh, I was appointed for three years. I set out at the time that I arrived that, you know, one of the things I wanted to do at the commission, which is, you know, in some respects, a technocratic function of the state was to, you know, make it sort of more democratic and for us as an organisation to be much more understanding and respectful of, you know, all the people who we serve and, and whose interests we seek to represent. And when I finish, I will, you know, look to to use that same sort of mission and approach wherever I uh, I go to next. But it's one that I know, you know, has now sort of taken root in the organisation. And whoever follows me is going to need to continue because that will be a, you know, it's it's an important part of us doing our job right. Is it in a better shape the sector? I mean, you've had those big investigations with major names, haven't you? There, but, but that might show a degree of health because you're you're looking at things and challenging the sector. We have driven a lot of changes and improvements in the Charity Commission itself so that we are much better equipped to hold charities to account. We have 
carried out inquiries into some of the biggest name uh, charities and not been in any way shy in doing so. That has led to real change and improvement amongst those charities themselves. I think that we see now there's some evidence of public trust and confidence starting to increase again as a result of that. But, you know, as I said at the beginning, Chris, this is a job that will never be done. Mm. This is something which will continue and must continue because I've been quite challenging of the charity sector and I make no apology for that because I care very much about all that it achieves. So we've heard you're standing down, Tina Stoll, in February. Um, you've been running the Charity Commission for three years. Do you Have you had enough powers to do your work? Do you want more power? Well, what I can tell you is that we've used our powers considerably over the last three years and, and we've used more powers more often than ever before. The power that we have to disqualify trustees, for instance, we used that 32 times just in 12 months Which alone. Which compares with... Well, I mean, you know, there didn't used to be that power in the past, but it's like statutory inquiries, which are the most serious inquiries. When we open those, that's using a power. And I think we closed over the last 12 months 180 of them. Back in 2012, the Commission did five of those. I mean, this is, this is the scale of the difference that we are now operating on. I, you know, we must exercise those powers. I'm very conscious about any regulator not having mission creep. You know, that that's always a danger. And Telegraph readers, I'm sure, would be very concerned about anything like that. But what I do want to make sure is that, and I've started talking to government about this, is that we have powers that allow us some greater control over what comes on and off the register because it goes back to what we were talking about before in terms of people's expectations of a charity when it is registered. Our powers around removing charities are perhaps not as clear as your readers would expect and want them to be. So I think that's something that does need so to change. So them off. So yeah, they, they lose their charity number, they lose their, their registration. At the moment, what happens is, is that the, the legal framework leads us to have to do quite a lot of intervention in a charity to get it back on track. And that, in my mind, can create more regulatory burden, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't often get us to where we need to be quickly enough. So that's an area where you know I, I do think there is scope to do more. And I think the other thing is, in terms of coming on to the register, what is perhaps not properly understood is that if something meets the legal test of a charity, we have to register it. Now, we are very, very strong in our scrutiny before we put anything on the register, not least because it takes us such a lot of effort to get it off You know, mm. when things go wrong. And we reject about 40 percent of all of the applications that we get and it's quite interesting to know Chris by the way that you know the rate of applications to come on a register is huge I mean that last year we had about 9,000 I mean it's averaging around 25 30 applications a day to right. come onto the register I mean it's big and we want to make sure that those who are obviously entitled to come onto the register and are sort of particularly these new standard bearers of charity that you might see forming in different parts of the country that might not have been sort of you know that able to get on the register before you know I want to make sure that we make it possible for new charity to come through but if we're going to do that you know I'm quite keen on a regime that would perhaps provide a two-year provisional phase so that there's a point at which we can say you haven't really cut the mustard or you know you came onto the register for a very specific need for a very specific time you can leave the register with your head held high and, and and everything else so I mean at the moment if we want to wind up a charity it would have to have you know, cease to exist and you know, you've got to go through an awful lot of stuff whereas if a charity is clearly one which is not delivering any real benefit and we may be able to disqualify trustees or whatever but actually the, the better outcome in terms of saving public money and everything else is to just shut it down and remove it I think there is a need for that. What will be the impact of COVID-19 on the sector do you think? Will it see a lot of charities closing? Well, I think, as I say, I think there are a lot of charities that are facing serious financial difficulties. Um, you know, we've seen... How many? Have you gamed out what the numbers might be? 
We haven't yet. I mean, there are some there are some predictions in terms of loss of income, but I think that a lot of the well-run charities are responding to this in the way that you would expect them to, which is they're you know cutting costs, they're having to reprioritise their activity and services. I would also say, by the way, that there are a lot of charities that have responded to this serious situation in a way which you know has led to them improving the way in which they actually sort of deliver on their services. A lot of charities have accelerated some of their digitization, all of the sorts of things that you know people talk about all the time. There's been more effort amongst some of the bigger charities to work with the smaller charities, which I think is incredibly important too. So there's a lot that's happening which is good and positive. But right now, because they are under threat, you know, they're worried about their income. Now is not the time to just assume that people will keep on supporting them. You know, now is the time to show we're changing. And if we if we start a new appeal for money or you know, as a here's charity, why. you know, mm. here's why. Not only just here's why, but actually We understand not only that you value the difference that we make or you want to help us support, you know, whatever needy cause or whatever important issue it is that we are pursuing, but actually that we're going to do it in a way that we're proud to show you meets those standards that you expect Mm -hmm. of any institution that calls itself a charity. Because being a charity, Chris, is a badge of honour. And I think anybody, you know, on our register is one that should always recognise that's a badge of honour. Have you forgotten that badge? I think sometimes there's a sense that, you know, I see sometimes that, you know, it can be a convenience. But I think that the best charities and the ones that will continue into the future and the ones that I know will keep receiving people's support are the ones that wear that badge with honour. That I know for sure. Baroness Stoll, Tina Stoll, thank you so much in what could be your valedictory interview as Charity Commission Chairman. Thank you for joining us this week on Topless Politics. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Right, stay with us. In just a moment, I'll be talking about angry Northern Tory MPs, frolicking lambs and fears for a no deal. Right after this. Hello, listeners. I'm Christopher Hope, interrupting your podcast listening to tell you about another show I know you'll enjoy. It's called The Trump Card, and it's a three-part series for the man who understands President Trump better than most, his friend Nigel Farage. Wow, what a job he did, Mr. Nigel Farage. Thank you very much indeed. Mr. Farage has been to the White House more than many world leaders. He then shook me by the hand. He said, thank you, thank you. He said, you will be my friend for life. So who better to tell us what Donald Trump is like when the cameras are off? You're dealing with somebody who, if he thinks you're a friend, he becomes a friend of yours. And as another unpredictable election draws near, what's his Trump card? Search the Trump card wherever you're listening to this podcast or go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash Trump card. And we're back. Now, this week, I wrote a tweet that went a bit viral after I revealed how a Tory MP told me the following about the mayor of Greater Manchester. The MP told me, we are on the cusp of having Andy Burnham carried shoulder high through the streets of Manchester. He has demonstrated courage and principle, hope and determination, and a spirit that the British people can be proud of. This is not normal language from a Tory MP, people. What crazy times we live in. And to discuss these times, I'm joined by William Ragg, Tory MP for Hazelgrove. And I should add, not the source of that quote. William Ragg, welcome to the podcast. Now, you're turning into a bit of a Thomas a Beckett, a turbulent MP, not a priest, a turbulent MP. Why do you vote against the government on a Labour Opposition Day debate? on Wednesday when they tried to put pressure on backbench MP to support more measures for tier three companies? Oh, well, well, thanks for having me on, Chris. But I think I vote with a heavy heart uh, against my own government. Perhaps it was a sense of frustration with the general situation, but certainly a need for me to send a clear signal to my constituents that they uh, were first and foremost in my, in my thoughts, rather than any apparent obligation to the party whip on that occasion. Yes, and you've been speaking out, haven't you, quite a lot about the failure of leadership here. 
And that's not easy for a Conservative MP, is it, to be forced to turn on your government in this way? Yes, but I think it's also been interpreted that I'm just critical of the government. I'm certainly not 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 no, critical not. of that. I'm you know anybody, criticizing everybody it seems at the moment. But I think particularly with the uh, the theatrics of the mayor and all of his shows and nonsense, I think it's no wonder that there's been a a, a sense of collective failure. Hopefully from today, I think we might be able to salvage something and and uh, and move forward. Well, we'll come on to the end of the week later, but let's quickly just run over what happened this week. Do you think the government made a mistake in trying to get Andy Burnham to sign up to these measures, given how ruinous they might be for local businesses? I mean, there's no way he would have done it with an election in May. Surely he wants to make out that it's the central government locking down companies that could lose jobs. No, and I think from from his position, he, he never really was going to do so because he would always be able to blame the government for uh, not providing enough support. So I think it was rather rather an interesting choice to enter in negotiations with him, particularly given that he doesn't have any statutory obligations in this area. It should have been really done via the uh, local authority leaders and particularly involving Conservative MPs in the process. I think we would have avoided much of the unnecessary spectacle and uh, whipped up anger that that we've seen. And I I include myself in part of that spectacle, of course, as a mere walk-on part. But I think we could have avoided much of that difficulty had it been approached in a slightly different way. Why do you think Number 10 has been a bit tinnied towards these negotiations? I don't think they've been been tinnied. I think what it is, is, you know, backdrops a pandemic. It's a completely unprecedented time. And then we've also got new sort of structures of, of local governance, which really haven't been tested before. I mean, I was completely against elected metro mayors and i think actually my opinion hasn't really changed i have to say <laughs> and you know if we, you know when these were created they were done without any reference to the you know the existing governance structures and so with an issue like this and combine that with the prospect of a mayoral election next year and everyone's been so well behaved so far then it was hardly surprising that a sort of conflagration was going to <laughs> come about something such high stakes and high politics like this. Yeah, do you think Andy Burnham has been trying to push the idea of this kind of victimhood status of the North and and, and has used that really to sow division here when it wasn't there before? Well, he's had to find a purpose for himself. And I, I don't mean that, you know, flippantly and insultingly. I, I mean in terms of what are the mayor's statutory obligations. And by the government negotiating with him, they, they've given him that platform to which he's done his usual star turn. And I, I think, therefore, he has been enabled, perhaps unwittingly by the government, to, to find a, a sense of purpose and then also be seen as a voice for a lot of pent up frustration, which I think is felt by people across the country, not just in Greater Manchester, but a great pent up frustration, which is only natural when you know, people's lives and livelihoods are, are, are limited to aid the fight against the pandemic. Yes, William Rag, this wasn't you, but I was told by a Tory MP that they thought we we're on the cusp of having Andy Burnham carried shoulder high through the streets of Manchester. And the MP said that he had demonstrated courage and principle, hope and determination, and a spirit that Britain should be proud of. <laughs> Do you worry that, well, how, why on earth are your colleagues thinking this about Andy Burnham? Well, that certainly wasn't me. I think <laughs> there it wasn't it was me. I'd I, I, I perhaps be a little more sarcastic in my remarks, such as, you know, a, a lay Miz audition, which seems to have been <laughs> taking place um, in, in, in Manchester, really. I don't know getting away from the fact that there is strong public mood, and certainly for my constituents, whatever their political persuasion, actually, they have been very supportive of those of us who have been seen to sort of speak up and, and voice that concern. And again, I think that comes from, Chris, from the frustration, which is only natural in people who are having their lives and livelihoods curtailed in this pandemic situation. You got there in the end, didn't you? The government eventually negotiated or spoke to the individual councils, or a dozen or so councils in Greater Manchester. So the money is going to go there, 65 million pro rata, what Liverpool and Lancashire got. Is that, is that how it's going to work then? So basically cut out these metro mayors if they're being difficult? Well, it, it is pro rata, but, but again, I mean, I, I take you back to my sort of fundamental uh, objection to tier three. I think the difference between those Conservative MPs like me who've been sceptical of this situation and have spoken out and Andy Burnham 
is that Trandy Burnham and, and others, it's all about how much money they can get. Well, that, that's fair play. They're socialists. That's what they do. But I actually think that people in Greater Manchester, the businesses in Greater Manchester, given their investment that they've made, whether it's various public venues, hospitality, this, that and the other, the investment that they've made to be COVID secure, they actually want to stay open, be able to trade. They want to be able to support themselves and support other people in employment. The people of Greater Manchester don't want to go cap in hand, you know, mixing metaphors with begging bowls and all this, that and the other. And that might be the socialist way, but it's certainly not the way that the people of Greater Manchester want to be able to live their lives, obviously, cautiously and in a, in a COVID secure way. So I think that we have to see that we're not singing entirely from the same hymn sheet, although the harmony at the moment seems to, uh, seems to chime quite well. I wonder if you think Greater Manchester went in too quickly to Tier 3, because talks in the North East have stopped overnight. We're recording this on Thursday morning in Nottingham numbers are down again week on week and they're only in tier two so i wonder whether there may be a a concern that the government rushed too quickly into tier three in some parts of the north yes and that's what i've expressed and i think perversely that as of cinderella o'clock this evening when everything you know just past midnight everyone has to close everything down and and shut up sharp i I think actually it is a, a premature move and my concern actually is that if you're not allowing people to um, you know, go to places in a COVID secure way, they're simply going to meet in other, each of us homes, where we know that the transmission rate of the virus is much higher. And so perversely, I feel that tier three could make matters worse as well as having a, a, a severe economic hit. And so you're, you're right in, in, in drawing on the data from other parts of the country, because what we were seeing in some parts of Greater Manchester was a flattening or indeed a falling of the daily case occurrence and now you know that needed perhaps a little more time to be analyzed and 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 to run through but i i really would be very disappointed if this has proved to be not just a premature move but a counterproductive move as well and also there's no guidance is there from the pm on how to get out of tier three i've been trying to follow his responses to you guys in in the house of commons he said that if the r number comes down below one that's a factor and I think other areas around bed usage in hospitals. But have you got the actual formula which can get your region out of tier three? No, listen, in, in, in all of this pandemic, as Orwell said once of language, it is data that is power. It is data that allows decisions to be made. And we can look at a whole raft of data, I suppose, to have an inkling as to when we might be uh, liberated from these restrictions. My assumption, and it's only an assumption, would be upon a combination of daily case rates continuing to fall and a reduction in any pressures in ICU. That, to me, would be the, the obvious measure of progress in these circumstances. Have you had any, any difficult conversations with your whips this week? Because you've been fighting half your region. You've had to. But have they been a bit cross about some of your, your outbursts? The whips are a very, very forgiving and generous and benevolently spirited cast of people. <laughs> so I, I couldn't imagine that they could ever be cross. Um, I think, I think though, I, I do. I, do I don't believe on. a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lying through my teeth, Christopher. No. Um, the whip always needs you for the next vote. Yes. Okay. So yes. They look it, forward, it, not back. Okay. It, indeed. <laughs> it is pointless dwelling too often on whipping misdemeanours. Although the, the great problem I have is that I like them all and I have a sneaking suspicion at least a few of them don't mind me. So it's an interesting relationship. Do you worry about the long-term damage to the government in the north of the red wall seats, the, the seats which we talk about as being important to hold the government's majority for, uh, in 2024? No, because I think there's plenty of time and there's plenty of good things that are going on and uh, lots more uh, of that will be able to uh, take place over the coming months and years. And I think we have to always bear in mind that the current time is set against the backdrop of a pandemic, which is going to be far from plain sailing, as we've seen. And really, I do have uh, great hopes of of, of continuing revitalisation for the Conservative Party in the north of England. William Ragg, Tory MP for Hazel Grove, Latter Day, Thomas A. Beckett in the north, Telling the government like it is for local people up there. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. All the best. Very kind of you. All the best. 
Now away from COVID, the C word, and onto the B word, Brexit. Like a couple who have spent too much time stuck together during lockdown, the relationship with the EU and UK hit another bump in the road during the torturous journey towards a possible deal to leave the European Union at the end of this year. One group worried about that news and worried about what it might mean for them are farmers. And this week I was joined by Mark Bridgman, president of the Country Land and Business Association, or CLA. Mark, hi, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. Mark, you're worried particularly about lamb exports, aren't you? What's your concern? Well, I think all food exports, but lamb, if you like, is the one that's probably going to be most affected. Our concern is a huge amount of lamb is exported to Europe, around 40% of our lamb. And it's 90% of all of our lamb exports goes to Europe. And it's a big chunk of what we produce. And we're going to see tariffs, if we have a no-deal situation, of around 60%. So our lamb would automatically become uncompetitive on the European market. It's the impact that our main trading partner will have, the knock-on effect. So if we can't sell lamb into Europe, it's going to mean we've got a huge surplus in this country, an imbalance, and that will drive down prices. In fact, we might not even be able to consume it because of the sort of mismatch on consumption. You know, so lamb might end up having to be put into cold storage and you know, at certain times of year when sort of peak times for selling lamb, you know, we're going to have a massive distortion in the market and we could see a big fall in prices. That's our concern. It's coming at, at the same time as, as a result of Brexit, we're moving away from the common agricultural policy. Um, the common agricultural policy, for a lot of farmers, the, the basic payment scheme, the subsidies that come into the farming sector, for a lot of sectors, particularly these livestock farms, that basic payment is crucial. So if you have a combination of basic payments being removed over the next few years, which is the government's plan, and a no deal and tariffs on our exports, it could have a, you know, a double whammy effect on this sector. It could do, but equally, the government says it wants to, wants to replace that money by rewarding farmers for other things too, for looking after their, their economy, or their local area, and making it more available to more people. The, all these ideas of, of public goods could find farmers rewarded in different ways, so the money may not fall at all. No, no. So the overall, the overall amount of money coming into the sector will, will stay the same. But it, as you say, it will be for, for doing different things. And so what I think you would see, if we had no deal and you had very high tariffs, that, that the number of sheep farmers would fall quite significantly and farmers would have to look to do different things with their land. I suppose the double impact of COVID plus the threat of a no deal is a worry were really the CLA and other farmers? Yeah, definitely. I mean, no deal is, from a purely farming, from an agricultural point of view, no deal is, is, is the real concern. But also linked to that, because let's hope that common sense will prevail and economic sense will prevail. And pretty much every business organisation on both sides of the channel have been arguing with their politicians. Um, and we've got come together with the CBI and 70 other organisations to say that we're down to a final negotiating part. And let's hope that common sense prevails and they will do a deal of some sort. The longer term issue is also around you know, future trade deals elsewhere. And you'll have read about and your listeners will know all about this sort of argument about standards. And that is a really, really important thing because we believe in this country we've got very high standards. And it's standards, it's not just about food safety. It's much broader than that. It's about the, the environmental standards that we comply with to produce food and the animal welfare standards that we comply with. Um, and so if we're being asked to, to comply with these and we are leading the way internationally, and certainly have been within Europe as well, it would be wrong, we believe, to import products that are produced to a lower standards for all sorts of reasons both competitively, um, environmentally, climate change, and, and, you know, and so on. And just, just finally, uh, Mark Bridgman, uh, you mentioned there about the issue of importing food, which is of a lower standard. Isn't it a question of labelling food properly? So if you are on a low income, you can't afford a better quality UK-grown meat, then why can't you buy meat from the US if it's branded as such and you take a risk yourself? Well, why can't the risk be on the person buying it? Why must they be told they can't have it? because of the issue of standards. Surely it's a risk for the person involved. When you're in America, do you refuse to eat, eat chicken because it's chlorine washed, for example? No, I do. I think in America, I would say it's not about safety. It's about, it's about how it's produced. 
And obviously, if you go into a supermarket in America, you can choose different types of chicken. And I, I get your point there. But then on, on what basis do you then say, if you take that to its conclusion, then you might as well stop farming in this country? Well, no, no not, not really. But what I'm trying to say to you is, don't you think people should have that choice themselves to choose cheaper food imported if they know it's imported, they know it's been bred in difficult conditions, but that's their choice because they may not be able to afford the better quality food grown in the UK? Personally, I don't think we should be allowing... If something is, we believe is having a negative impact on, say, the environment, I don't think we should allow it. If that food on the supermarket says it's had an impact on deforestation in Brazil, that soya-fed beef, yes, people might buy it, but do you not think as a country and as a, as a government we ought to lead by example? If we genuinely believe in you know, climate change or, or turning around global biodiversity loss, which I, which I do... Mark Bridgman, the very best for you as you approach this difficult time towards the end of this year with your farmers. But thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells and Elliot Lampett. And most importantly, thank you to my guests this week, Baroness Stoll, Tina Stoll, William Ragg and, of course, Mark Bridgman. My guests, as ever, were telling it straight today. And someone else calling themselves Telling It Straight left a review on Apple Podcasts. They said, Excellent podcast with consistently good material, interviews and chat. Recommend. Well, thank you, Telling It Straight. We aim to keep booking guests who, like you, tell it like it is. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please do leave us an Apple rating and a review just like Telling It Straight. It really helps other people find this show. And we can't thank you enough. And another way to support our brilliant journalism here at The Telegraph is by taking out a subscription. You can get 30 days free access to our content, free of charge, by going to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper. After that, you pay just £2 a week. And if you want to get in touch to sing our praises, offer a criticism, or even offer up a guest, please email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk, or follow us on Twitter, we're at chopperspodcast. Finally, as ever, from the team here to you all, please always buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph if you can. You won't regret it. Until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!